assure you of all of the uh, roundtables that we've done, if you've been part of the first two, the one first one that was in person, the second one that was virtual, uh, and now this third one, this is the most infuriating one. <laughs> if <laughs> when we're done today, if you're not upset as to how our prescription drug system operates and works, um, you know, you might work for the industry. Let's just put it that way. Uh, maybe that's why. Uh, but because this is one of those things, I think every time I give this discussion or we, we have this discussion and we're talking to people about it, just uh, there's so many of the, oh, are you serious? That's really the way it works? And it's, yes, I'm serious. That's really the way it works. But understand that the purpose of today is not just to tell you what's wrong with the system, rather what you can do to improve how the system operates for you. Uh, we are certainly going to demonize some folks today. So there you go. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and get ahead of that. Um, I'm, but before I do that, I'm going to give them credit. We need the pharmaceutical industry. Nobody wants to go back to the days of snake oil out of the back of chuck wagons. Okay. Uh, we want the pharmaceutical industry to be successful because that success leads to their ability to continue to manufacture new drugs that they bring to market every day. But we want to make sure that just like we talk about managing the healthcare supply chain, we're doing our darndest to manage the prescription drug supply chain. So just to recap the first uh, uh, conversations that we had, and Elliot just mentioned it, the first one was on the general healthcare supply chain as a whole, that there are four components to the healthcare supply chain. There is inpatient services. This is hospital systems for the most part. There's outpatient services. This is the broadest aspect of supply chain because it encompasses outpatient surgical facilities and imaging centers and physical therapies and all of those types of things. There is physicians, and that's what we talked about last time, the, the gatekeepers of the supply chain. And then the fourth component is prescription drugs. So we're doing those in a little bit of a different order because we talked about them broadly. We talked about uh, physicians last time, we, and then we talked, uh, we're talking about prescription drugs this time. Our next series, we're going to talk about inpatient. Uh, we're going to talk about that, and then we'll obviously have one session where we do on outpatient uh, services and those types of things. But uh, the culmination of this conversation, though, for today is going to center around prescription drugs. Now, uh, as Elliot mentioned earlier, there is a chat box. We do want this to be a round table and it's obviously a lot more fun and, and entertaining if we can do this uh, in person. Thanks a lot, COVID. Uh, but nonetheless, we do have a chat box. Feel free to chat at us. We've muted everybody. So if you do, you can if you want to, you can unmute yourself. I would encourage you though, if you do unmute yourself, do so with intentionality. Uh, in that you're trying to get our attention to ask a question, feel free to do that. Um, and do us a favor and, and mute yourself back when you're done. Uh, we, we, the ambient noise uh, through virtual uh, discussions can be uh, annoying. Uh, and, and so we, we want to encourage you to mute yourself when you're, when you're not, uh, not on the mic. Um, okay, so let's talk about the prescription drug arena. So, I'm going to throw a few kind of stats at you a little bit, uh, and then we're going to talk about it. We're going to we're going to demonize who we need to demonize, and then we're going to solve the problem uh, and start talking through it. So, oftentimes when we think about prescription drugs, we think about the pharmaceutical industry, and certainly the pharmaceutical industry is the primary source of the prescription drug arena. However, they are not the primary driver of the prescription drug business. We might think that they are, but they're not. In the early 1960s, late 1950s, there came to be a new sector of the pharmacy world called the PBM, or Pharmacy Benefit Manager. Now, the Pharmacy Benefit Manager for nearly 50 years stood as an independent entity whose sole responsibility and fiduciary responsibility was to the patient. Their job was to effectively serve as the wholesale arm between the pharmaceutical industry who is manufacturing the drug and the corner of happy and healthy who is selling you the drug to, to each individual, the retail pharmacy. And they came about in the late 50s and early 60s in large part because of this significant movement of prescription drug companies. So as, as new prescription drugs found their way to the market, there became this challenge with how do we negotiate with them? How do we buy in bulk? 
How do we manage the process flow of drugs from the manufacturer to the end user through the insurance entity who is ultimately paying for them? And so thus, pharmacy benefit managers were born. And they served a very important role at first because they did serve as that aggregator, that, that group that would say, hey, let us make sure that we're buying a certain number of these drugs and dispersing them appropriately so that at the end of the day, the patient can get it, the insurance company can pay for it, and that the system is in balance. Fast forward to today, and they have certainly perverted their role. And their fiduciary responsibility by no means can be established by saying that they are thinking about the patient first, at least not for the most part. There are today in the United States something near, I think the last number I saw was 300 pharmacy benefit managers. You can quite literally throw a rock and hit one. However, there are four pharmacy benefit managers in the United States today that manage the distribution of over 80% of all drugs. So if there are 300 PBMs, these are the wholesalers that are negotiating the pricing of drugs. There are four that control 80% of the market. This is where it gets fun. Those four are CVS, Express Scripts, Optum, and Prime. These three companies control now 80% of all legal drug distribution in the United States. As my friend Ziad Rabai refers to them, they are, in effect, the U.S. legal drug cartel. Now, I'm not going to demonize them completely, because sometimes you need them to be your friends. But we do certainly have a problem when four companies control 80% of the market distribution. We have a bigger problem when all four are now owned by or own health insurance companies. Express Scripts is owned by Cigna. CVS owns Aetna. Optum is owned by United Healthcare, and Prime Therapeutics is owned by Blue Cross and Blue Shield. These four companies are managing your drug spend. And why is that important? Let us go back to where this all started going terribly wrong. March 23rd, 2010. If that date rings a bell to you, it should. It was the day in which the Affordable Care Act was passed into law. The Affordable Care Act had a key provision in it that required insurance companies to spend, on average, 85 cents of every dollar they collected on claims. And it had CFOs and CEOs and boards of directors scrambling very quickly to determine how they could continue to provide shareholder value at a 15% capped margin. Now, I'm sure that the authors of the Affordable Care Act were well intended in their uh, position on what is called the MLR, or Medical Loss Ratio Mandate, but they were just flat stupid in how they wrote it. Because if you are capped at 15%, do you want 15% of a million dollars or a billion dollars? Percentages don't matter, numbers do. And what happened was, after this law was passed, we found a healthcare system who historically had been in conflict with the healthcare delivery system and the insurance system, now were aligned. Claims needed to go up so health insurance companies could generate more revenue. But, and while that in, in its, of itself is what catches most attention this, these days, what largely went unnoticed was the movement behind the scenes for health insurance companies to align themselves with pharmaceutical pharmacy benefit managers. And so let's break this down. First, let's talk about how pharmacy benefit managers make their money. And to do this, I'm going to attempt to bring in a screen here so that we can draw, because I'm a frustrated kindergartner and a visual learner. 
Now, if you are currently seeing the grid of all the people on the call, you may want to go to the top right corner and you're going to see four square boxes and click on the one that's the one square box. So that way this will magnify your screen here. Um, I'll walk through these uh, as we talk through them, but it may help if you are just seeing this screen on your computer. So in the PBM world, when they first began in the 60s, they charged a fee. This is how they made their money. The fee was on a per script basis. So that fee, when the PBM would negotiate the price of the drug from the pharmaceutical company, when it was distributed through the corner of Happy and Healthy or the local retail pharmacy, they would charge a fee, a distribution fee. And in the 60s, that fee was nominal. We're talking pennies on the dollar, or pennies, period, not even on the dollar. It was a it was very low fee. That grew over time, and today some estimates are that the fee is, is in the average of $16 per script. Now, again, why does that matter, especially if you're thinking about the fact that a lot of drugs are for $10, $15, $20 to distribute? Well, that tells you how much they're making on the fees on the bigger drugs. But fee was the main prior, primary way in which... Uh, these organizations made their money. Fast forward a few years and we found a new way for PBMs to make money and it's called the spread. So the pharmacy world operates in large part much like the stock market world does in that if you think about you know, the, the Dow Jones or the NASDAQ and the ticker symbol that's running across your TV screen in the mornings, if you're watching CNBC or Bloomberg or Fox Business, you're seeing movement, right? You're seeing numbers of shares multiplied by their price, availability, things like that. The prescription drug market works relatively the same way in that prescription drug pricing will fluctuate on a daily basis based on cost and demand and utilization and so on and so forth. And this process is through what we call the AWP, or average wholesale price. This is the average wholesale price of the drug. Now, the average wholesale price of the drug will vary based on quantity, okay? And so for just purposes of today's conversation, we're going to say that the quantities are a million pill distribution, a 100,000 pill distribution, and 10,000 pill distribution. So if you're a PBM, if you're Optum, and you're working with AbV or AstraZeneca or Pfizer or Merck, and you're negotiating a drug, you're going to negotiate based on, <coughs> excuse me, one of these three categories. I'm buying a million pill distribution, I'm buying a 100,000 pill distribution, I'm buying 10,000 pill distribution. Now this is an important thing to remember because when we talk about independent PBMs in a moment, we're gonna come back to this. Because what will happen is, and we'll use Merck for example, Merck will say, well, okay, we'll add a million pill distribution, and I'm using just pick numbers here. This is just for purposes of illustration. It's $3 a unit at a million distribution. At 100,000 distribution, it's $6 a unit, and at 10,000 $10, distribution, it's $10 a unit. So think Costco, think Sam's Club, think, hey, if we're buying in bulk, we're going to get a price per unit much, much lower. And so that's the way the AWP works. And this fluctuates daily, okay? So the way that spread pricing works is that a PBM can purchase the drug at a million pill distribution and sell it at a $10 pill distribution thus packaging the spread between the two. Now, our, our government and their wisdom put some rules in place that said, no, 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 we're not gonna allow you to do that. You can certainly buy here and spread, but you can only spread once. So PBMs are really smart and they figure out a way that, okay, well, if we just pack, buy it here, sell it to ourselves here, then sell it to ourselves here again, before it ultimately gets to the retail pharmacy, we have now had three different transactions so for tense purposes under this, 
PBM will buy the drug here. They will sell it here. So they're making a spread. So if you're following along at home, if I have a fee, and we'll just say, we'll take the low end and say that fee is $10 per script. And in my analogy, you know, my illustration here, they're making a $7 spread. Now, now we're making some money, right? But that wasn't enough. The PBMs, who now control the market, the PBM oftentimes will make more money than the actual pharmaceutical company that's making the drug when all is said and done. They hold the power. They then said, we want more. And so they established what is called a rebate structure. Said differently, a commission. The PBMs will negotiate with the pharmaceutical companies rebates. And effectively what this is, is an amount of money that will be paid based on volume that is sold. So if Optum goes to Pfizer and says, if we distribute 10 million units, you have to pay us a bonus. And Pfizer agrees. And these rebates can be a lot of money. Now, there's been a lot of attention paid to rebates as of late, as, as organizations like 60 Minutes have done exposés, CNN, and some others. And so rebates have been in the spotlight, but understand that rebates are actually only one piece of the puzzle. There are two other areas in which PBMs make money that a lot of times don't get focused on. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because one key thing, who controls your formulary? You know, that's the piece that says whether a drug is preferred or not preferred under your plan. Now, there's been a long thought behind that, that preferred drugs must be the ones that are cheaper or we get a better deal on. No. Oftentimes, preferred drugs are the ones that they are paying a higher rebate. Have you ever had a situation where you filled a drug only to go in and fill it again 60 days later or something to find out that now the copay has changed? It's now no longer a preferred drug? Well, guess what probably happened? Another drug came along that had a higher rebate or had a better spread. And by the way, on the spread pricing, I left out one key component. The government allows the PBM to set the AWP price based on any 30-day window. So remember how I said that it works a lot like the stock market and its cost and demand? So if I buy a drug today, and it could be a different price tomorrow, well, if I buy a whole lot of drugs today, what oftentimes will happen to the average wholesale price? basic cost and demand goes up. That means that while they bought it here, they sold it here, they get 30 day runway to determine what they get to report the price to be. So that gives them more gap. Why is that important? Because your claims dollars are ultimately paying for this. Why are insurance companies interested in being in alignment with PBMs? Because if I'm the insurance company and I'm capped at an 85% medical loss ratio, 85 cents of every dollar I collect from you, I have to go pay out in a claim. I have to report that I do. I need this number to be as big as possible because if this number creeps all the way up to $15, I actually, as the insurance company, because I own the PBM, only paid three but I get to report to Uncle Sam for purposes of the Affordable Care Act that I spent 15. Thus is the reason why last quarter United Health Group, who has the largest PBM integrated relationship with Optum, reported a $6 billion profit last quarter. Their stock price since the passage of the Affordable Care Act is up over a thousand percent. Are we mad yet? I hope so, because it's through that that we can start to think about how things change and how we can engage differently. So here's the most important thing that you should know today. If you're an employer and you are providing benefits to your employees, 
you control your plan. You control the PBM. And if the insurance company you are working with will not allow you to choose your PBM or review the contract, you can change. And many states are now allowing the employer to carve out the PBM even if they are fully insured. If they are fully insured with Blue Cross, they can still, many states, I don't believe Nebraska is there yet, but this is certainly something if you're going to write to your legislators, I would do so about, and say, we want to be able to pick our own PBM and not use prime therapeutics. If you're with United Healthcare, we want to be able to pick our PBM and not use Optum. And you want PBM contracts that provide you transparency. Where are you making your money? You want PBM contracts that give you control of the formulary. If there is a drug that can be purchased at lower cost, we want you to be able to utilize that drug as the preferred drug. PBM should allow you to be able to exclude certain drugs or utilize programs directly created by the manufacturers. We're going to talk about that here in a second. But you should have the control to be able to navigate what is the fastest growing area of expenditure in your health plan today. Now, for some of you, that might be CVS, Optum, Express Scripts, or Prime Therapeutics. The only way to know that is with the data. And the reason I say that sometimes it still makes sense to be with these companies is because they do get significant volume discounts on certain drugs. So even with their way of doing business, because of the volume of the drug they buy, they oftentimes can still get a better deal than a pass-through PBM independent. All that is based on your actual drugs, which is why it is in Imperatively important that at least annually you are analyzing the drug utilization against the formulary cost and the ingredient cost so that you can determine if your contract is right for you based on your utilization. It is not uncommon for us with many of our clients to sometimes move them back into a world where they are working with one of the big four. But we do that in two key areas. One, identifying that the specific drugs that are needing to be procured, those companies are getting a better deal on. And two, oftentimes requiring a new layer of the contract where we still have the right to the data. And oftentimes we are successful in negotiating that if there are rebates, they are passed through to our clients. This is a key component. I'm okay with PBMs making their money, but not in all three areas and not at the expense of the client. And this is something that is very much hidden. Now, PBMs are smartening up about this. They're getting very wise to the industry trying to solve for this. And so oftentimes the PBMs who do not want to end this practice are also building in fees for insurance brokers. It's very common and it's non-reportable. So depending on your company size, oftentimes you have to file what's called a 5500 report. This is an annual compensation report based on how much insurance brokers are making on your plan and where your money's going. PBM rebate marketing fees to brokers are not reportable. And so it's very difficult to ever determine whether or not there are fees being paid, but they are. And it's important that you see the contract to find out where your money is going. You can control it. You can manage it. So that is part one. I'm going to pause there. Andrew, do we have any questions that have come in? If you want to unmute yourself, this is a great opportunity to do that. Ask whatever questions. There's two other components I want to make sure that we talk about today on the roundtable. Uh, we're going to talk about a process called white bagging. Uh, and, and how you can uh, eliminate that. And then we're going to talk about uh, patient assistance programs that are available. Oh, so somebody commented that I, my, my big head is in the way of the screen. And uh, yeah, not surprising. Um, we'll also make sure that we can send out a summary after this. But effectively, three key areas in which PBMs make money, fees, spread, and rebates. 
The way that pricing on prescription drugs is established is a process called AWP, Average Wholesale Price. Okay. And oftentimes that can have up to three transactions by the time you buy the drug. Seth, maybe a reason. Oh, go ahead, Elliot. I think you said the same thing I was. Well, uh, maybe, yeah. I was just going to ask Seth um, if I'm an employer, how do I see these costs or can I? And if so, how do I see them? Yeah, so great question. Um, you can see them if your contract allows you to. <laughs> and so this is why, again, I tell you, it's very important that you understand what's in your PBM contract. Uh, because a lot of times PBMs will hide behind confidentiality arrangements and things like that. Now, that's not to say that every confidentiality arrangement that you can see every little thing, but most of the time you can um, if you're in the right PBM contract. The key here is ask for a copy of the PBM agreement and then make sure someone who knows what they're doing is advising you and walking you through it because it can look like it's written in Latin. I mean, there there is a number of things there. Matter of fact, these can be so... Um, detailed that I would tell you that as someone who I think is fairly well versed in this, I even anytime I'm reviewing a PBM contract, I have outside counsel that I bring in to review it with me, people that know the ins and outs of this, uh, because it's so easy to miss little things and little things really matter on this. Um, if you are fully insured, it is likely that you are going to be unable to see any of this because they won't share it with you. That's the sad reality of the fully insured space right now in America and specifically in Nebraska is they are not bound to show you anything in that. Seth, hey, it's Andy. Uh, I was gonna make the comment that probably part of the reason we might not have a couple questions is because we had some technical difficulty for people getting in. So if you are one of those people, know that we were we will get uh, a copy of this recording out to you so you can fill in blanks of what you may have missed to this point because this is undeniably one of the most powerful conversations around healthcare uh, strategy and ways to ways to control spend so if you had technical difficulties we will make that right for you yeah thanks Andy. and i will tell you too this is arguably the lowest hanging fruit out there <laughs> um because at the end of the day, these are dollars just being left on the table to somebody else. So unless you just want to help United Health Group stock price um, or Cigna's or Blue's or any of these others, um, this is your money. Uh, and so why spend more if you don't have to? And so while we've talked about the general structure and the way PBMs, let me, let, and, and we've established that there is a time to use an independent PBM who will procure these drugs for you, be very transparent, work on a fee-only basis. There's some good ones out there. SmithRx is one we use a lot. They charge a flat fee per employee per month, and you can use any program you want within a Magellan RX does a great job. There's a number of others that are out there that are doing some really good work in this space. Um, but, you know, there are times where you do have to partner with the big boys, right? With the CVS, with the Prime, with the Optum, uh, with the Express Scripts, just because of the specific drugs that are being utilized. And so it's important that you don't jump on what a lot of our industry are doing, is, which is the bandwagon of, well, unless you're using an independent PBM, you're doing yourself a disservice. I, I don't subscribe to that theory. Sometimes the bigger PBMs are doing you a better service than the independent, not because they're not malicious in their intent. They just get a better deal and you should be taking advantage of it. But you should still try to get as much as you can out of them. Understanding your contract is very, very important, especially as we continue to move forward and the price of drugs continues to go up. Now, understand I said earlier that I was going to demonize the industry. I, I, it is imperatively important that pharmaceutical companies be able to generate enough revenue to make up their research and development. On average in the United States, it takes 12 years and up to $2 billion to bring a dr new drug to market. Let us hope that's not the case with a COVID vaccine, but it is certainly the case with many drugs. And this is also why throughout the world, we hear reports a lot of times that other countries spend a lot less on prescription drugs for the same drugs than we spend here in the US. And that's true. And while certainly it would be easy to say, well, that's just not right and we shouldn't allow for it, um, that if we just said it wasn't allowed would mean that we would actually probably pay more in the United States. And that's because other countries 
by and large have price fixing. So if Pfizer or Merck or AstraZeneca or AbbVie or any of these pharmaceutical companies want to sell their drug in their country, they have to do so at a lower price. What does that mean? Well, that does mean that the United States citizen pays more to offset that. But if we said, no, we're not going to allow that, and those drugs all of a sudden weren't allowed to be sold in those countries, we would pay even more. Or those companies would no longer do the necessary research and development. And so I'm not going to get into a political discussion here, but certainly this is a conversation that needs to be had, but needs to be had in a much broader way than you're getting in the talking points you'll hear on Sunday morning talk shows. This is more than a political talking point for a politician. This needs to be clear understanding of how our state trade policy works in conjunction with other countries around the world. The rest of the countries have pricing fi price fixing, and they can because we don't here. But it's high time we start having different negotiation tactics with our trade partners. That's the most I'll talk about on the political side. So let's talk about two other key things that are very important for you to be able to take advantage of and think about how your plan is going to treat certain things. The first, as I mentioned earlier, is a process called J-coding. Now, this is a new tactic utilized by the healthcare system by which doctors will actually administer the drug directly to the patient as opposed to allowing the patient to fill it through a specialty pharmacy. It's also called white bagging is another term for it. And you need to know if this is allowed in your health plan. Because if it's allowed, you could take a drug that you could get for $500 and be spending $20,000. I've seen it up that much. Now, on average, it's usually about two to three times the price of the drug. So if you're able to get a drug through a specialty pharmacy for, let's say, $500, on average, a white bag J-coded drug would be somewhere in the range of $2,000. The process, again, here is where a physician will have the drug sent to them, and then they themselves will provide it to the, the patient. That should never be allowed in your plan. So it is important that you look at your plan document and your agreements with your pharmacy benefit manager to see if that component is allowed. If it is, you need to get it out of your contract immediately. The third key thing are patient assistance programs, or PAPs, as we like to talk about them. So in the United States- Hey, Seth, the, yeah, Seth, yep. before you do that, sorry, this is Elliot. Could you maybe just talk like, again, real quick, how would I get that out of my contract? When you say that, what do you mean or how could I go about that as an the, employer? Yeah, the best way, again, and, I, and, I, and I'm sorry if you're fully insured on this call, I apologize. There's not, you, you, you're hosed. I mean, there's just not a lot you can do if you're fully insured. Um, the benefit that I would tell you, if you're fully insured, the secondary question I would have to that is why? Because don't lie to yourself. Nobody's fully insured anymore. Everybody's self-funded. If you cost the insurance company more money than they make, they're going to ask for it back and they're going to get it back. So this self-funding is not as scary as it used to be. So long as you're not self-funding based on, based on the luck strategy, you know, like I hope we don't have bad claims. Um, cancer doesn't know if you're fully insured or self-funded and it could care less, right? And if you cost the insurance company more money, they're just going to ask for it. So there needs to be strategies in place. And that's one of the things we'll talk about in a subsequent virtual roundtable of how you can manage oncology claims differently and manage um, various large claims differently. But for purposes of the question, Elliot, it, it, you're not going to be able to get this if you're not self-funded. Through your claims data reports, you're going to just look for J codes. And if you see them in there, then you know that they're being allowed through your plan. So you need to talk to your, whoever your administrator is, your health plan administrator, whether that's Blue Cross, Aetna, Cigna, or an independent like a Consociate or a Maritain. And you need to be able to have the conversation around, are you allowing J codes? I do not want them to be allowed in my plan. They need to be excluded. The third thing that we want to talk about, though, are these PAPs, these patient assistance programs. Now, as part of the patent process in the United States, uh, most pharmaceutical companies are required to set up PAPs or patient assistance programs. These are programs by which uh, patients can get access to these drugs if by, they can't afford them. Again, you got to understand a patent on a drug in the United States on average is 20 years. It's a long time. And so Uncle Sam's got some rules of the road. In addition, most pharmaceutical companies that create drugs they get extensions on those patents. And so what happens is in the manufacturing phase, uh, once they have a, a different version of the patent or tweak it, they can file for a patent extension. 
Um, you see that a lot. Uh, matter of fact, Humera, made by AVB, I think is up to over 140 different patents and is now on their 28th year of patent protection. Um, and that's in large part because they, right before their patent expires, they tweak it just a little bit, just enough to go to uh, Uncle Sam and get a patent extension. And that's just the reality. Now, as part of that, though, they have to create patient assistance programs. And you've heard about these. I assure you've heard about these because if you've turned on your television lately and watched a television commercial, you've heard about it at the end. It's when the person comes on at the end of the commercial and says, can't afford your drug, AstraZeneca may be able to help. They say it really fast. They don't give you any details, and they move right along. Um, and that's the reality. So, but these things exist. Why aren't you using them? You should. And sadly, most people don't know that they exist and they don't utilize them because I assure you the PBM is never going to tell you about it. Because if you use the patient assistance program, A, that means those dollars don't flow, flow through your health plan, which means they're not getting a kickback, a rebate, or spread pricing. The insurance company is not going to tell you about it. And if your broker is getting a kickback from the PBM, they're probably not going to tell you about it either. Unless, of course, they might be losing the business. But these things are real and they should be used. For example, many drugs on the market today, if your member that needs the drug is below a certain threshold of income, they can probably get the drug for free. And when I say below a certain threshold, I'm not talking about a federal poverty line. I'm talking about some drugs have, federal, have thresholds of up to nearly $200,000 in annual income. And if you make less than that, you qualify for a patient assistance program if you ask. Some drugs, depending on the drug, will require as part of their patient assistance program that the drug be excluded from not be uh, able to be filled through your health plan. Why is this important? Because you control your plan document. And as long as it's not what's called an orphan drug, in other words, there's only one solution to it, you can exclude the drug. So for example, Humera and Stelera, both rheumatoid arthritis drugs, both do other things too. I think now Humera is up to solving for ingrown toenails. At least that's what we're probably going to hear about on their next commercial because they continuously come out with something else that it does. Um, nonetheless, you can actually carve out components of Humira for certain conditions based on whether or not there's other drugs that treat that same condition. That does not mean that we don't want your employee to be able to get Humira if they need it. What that means is that if we exclude it, we can go directly to AbV, the maker of Humira, and get that drug and not pay the spread pricing to the PBM, not pay the rebate to the PBM, and utilize those dollars that are available through the patient assistance program. That means if we're using those dollars, we're not using your plan's claims dollars. This is widely unused and widely unknown but it's out there. And if you're not utilizing it, if you're not analyzing your prescription drug claims data today and looking for specifically those specialty drugs that have high price tags and looking to see if there are patient assistance programs, you're not only doing yourself a disservice, you're doing your members a disservice. Because if that patient can get that drug for free with no copay, no coinsurance, no deductible, why aren't you allowing them to do that? So, these programs are available, but you have to pay attention, and you have to know that they're available. And you've taken a huge first step by being part of this conversation. So, I would encourage you, as we kind of summarize the, we'll call it the uh, lecture part of this, <laughs> um, look at your PBM contract. Understand who your PBM, who are they really working for? What is the pricing structure? What happens to rebates? Is spread pricing allowed? What is the formulary cost and who picks that formulary? These are questions you should be asking or someone should absolutely be asking for you. Second, is my plan allowing for J codes? Is it allowing, is allowing for white bagging? If it is, you need to get rid of that. And then third, are there drugs that my members can be using that are on patient assistance programs. And this is the one thing I would tell you, if you're fully insured, you can take advantage of this. Remember, if you're fully insured, the health insurance company is largely basing your premiums based on your performance, even if they're not telling you how bad your performance is or good.
patient assistance programs can still be available if your members are using, uh, if you're unfully insured. Now, does that mean that you can exclude a drug? No, probably not. But it doesn't mean that your people still can't use those patient assistance programs. And if they use those programs, then um, your claims fund won't be paying for that drug, and thus your claims costs will go down. These are all strategies that need to be implemented immediately uh, if you're managing your health care plan. Because at the end of the day, it's your money, it's your plan. You just need to manage it differently. With that, I will open it up to questions. Yeah, and feel positive. free to either unmute. The one positive of being virtual is people can't throw things at me, and that's a good thing. Usually, <laughs> angry people. A Andrew can. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you can, if you have a question, please unmute and ask or feel free to pop it into that chat window um, and we'll answer it um, as we go here. But uh, yeah, we'll give it a, a couple minutes. I will say this, it is, it, you know, listen, our pharmacy, the pharmaceutical industry and the pharmacy industry is changing uh, quite rapidly. You might've heard if you're geeky and follow things like this, like I do, um, that not long ago there were there were gag orders placed on pharmacists because if you would go in to fill a drug, um, you know if there was a lower cost version version of that drug, then uh, pharmacists were placed under gag orders. They couldn't tell you about it. Um, that for the most part under the Trump administration has been lifted, um, and so these are really important. The second thing I would say to this is, and this is something that we're working on at Ella Brock Norris. So if we represent you, you'll be hearing about this very soon. Is there are other companies that have alternative drug pricing programs. Um, outside of your PBM. So even if you have a PBM, there might be a better deal. You're hearing a lot of commercials about things like GoodRx, right? GoodRx is a secondary PBM. <clears throat> they actually get paid per fill a fee. That's how they make their money. But oftentimes their pricing is significantly less expensive than the PBM contract, even the ones that we would get if we have a good PBM contract. Remember, there is no perfect PBM contract. And so while a contract under a PBM might be good for one set of drugs, and as an analysis, we would do, we would say, well, this is the primary drugs that we're using. We need the best contract there. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best contract for these drugs. Remember, PBMs are negotiating all the time based on what drugs their patients, their clients are filling. And so while one might get Lipitor at a really good price, you know, it may not get Stellara at a great price. And so... This is why the secondary PBM programs are important. And so for our clients at Elbrock Norris, we are in the final stages of, of finalizing a, an agreement with one of these good RX-like companies so that we can dual cover PBM contracts and so that we can hopefully utilize more than one in the event that one has better pricing for something else. But it's important to start looking at those types of programs too and make sure that your employees understand them as well. Seth, without uh, diving, you know, too into the weeds on this, maybe talk about the importance of data when it comes to uh, prescription drugs and the strategies that a lot of what you're talking about relies on good data, right? Well, sure. Um, and, and, and listen, I always say that, that data is the key to everything because if you don't have data, you're effectively just throwing things on the wall and hoping they're sticking. Um, you would never want to make financial decisions without data to back up the reasons as to why. And so... Which, which PBM might be most important to you? I don't know if you don't have data. We need to understand what drugs are being filled. We need to understand what the formulary cost of that drug is. What, what is the ingredient cost? Where are they placing that drug within the formulary? What is their structure of change in that formulary rates? All of these things matter in a PBM contract and they all hinge on your ability to understand what's going on. If you're not in a platform that provides you access to data, then you are effectively throwing your hands up and saying, I don't care about my healthcare supply chain in this area, and I'm just going to go with whatever I got. And I would tell you, if that's you, and I'm not trying to offend anybody, stop complaining. You have nothing to complain about because you weren't willing to do the thing you needed to do to make sure you put yourself in the best position to succeed. Absolutely. Do you have any other questions from... Any of the folks that were on, either unmuted or in the chat window? Seth, not, I mean, we'll, we'll is there for a few more minutes? Oh, go ahead. Seth, is there any uh, restrictions, like income restrictions, on the patient assistance program? If you'd exclude the drug, is it available no matter what, or are there are some limitations around that? 
there's there's always can be limitations. It depends on the drug and it depends on the manufacturer and it depends on the specific uh, patient assistance program. It's rare to find um, patient assistance program if the drug is completely excluded that won't at least cover something uh, and, and do a lot. And this is where I would tell you to understand that your plan document can be amended. And so we've had this happen before. It doesn't happen often where someone excluded a drug the patient in the end did not qualify for a patient assistance program because of a specific drug. So we just added the drug back in. We lifted the exclusion. You can do that. What you don't want to do, though, is exclude the drug after it's found out that the patient needs it um, because now that can be seen as discriminatory. So it's important to be strategic about when you exclude the drug. If you do it at open enrollment, at your plan year renewal, you can do it along with a certain drug class, and that really works. Um, there are cases, again, depending on the drug, where there are some in income levels. I doubt that um, Warren Buffett would qualify for very many of the patient assistance programs. Uh, but outside of that, most people would.